Okay, we will start uh, from uh, last class we looked at the typical resistance spot welding thermal cycle, right. So, we looked at uh, uh, a simple thermal cycle, what we have looked at it is say, say for example, uh, current or it can also be load, which is also important, right, to keep uh, the two phase interfaces together. So, basically a uh, cycle looks like, so we will start the first loading, the moment we achieve a required load and then the current will also start forming, okay. So, load cycle will be something like this and then the current cycle, so if you look at if you take a red one, orange one, so then you will have a current cycle going something like that, okay, right. So, typically the, 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 the current uh, will be in few kilo amperes. It is for uh, 1.2 mm thick. So, why always I use 1.2 mm, right, even for filler wire and for sheet. And these are very commonly used thicknesses and diameters uh, for uh, any appli engineering applications, especially for automotive industries, right. So, I pick up 1.2, which is my favorite thickness to an experiment. So, so 1.2 mm thick uh, 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 steel, we use about uh, you know, 4 to uh, 8 kilo amperes based on the well nugget size, what we want, okay. So, the kilo, uh, the, the load would be in uh, somewhere, uh, so around few uh, uh, thousand kilo newtons, uh, so, uh, newtons or uh, kilo newtons, 3 or 4 kilo newtons, depends, okay. So, that is the typical, uh, uh, the, the current and then load we use and this is a very simple thermal cycle, okay. So, this would do a job for us, but we always agree, right, and we will have to modify uh, various, uh, the, the, for example, thermal cycles. Uh, you want to introduce a pre-weld pre uh, heating or a post-weld heating and uh, in some cases you know, it is uh, important to raise the temperature more gradually or more at a very slow rate, okay. So, in that case and this simple weld thermal cycle may not give you uh, the uh, freedom to play around with the, the welding parameters, for example, heating rate, cooling cooling rate or holding time for example or if you want to introduce in a post-weld heat treatment, you can also do it here same well thermal cycle. So, apply in a, in a post pulsing, okay. So, the you would have a, you will have a second current pulse which can go like that. So, that will give us like sort of an a post well heat treatment. So, the various possibilities can be achieved by modifying the current and uh, the load uh, the cycle what we apply while doing while applying typical well thermal cycle, okay. So, uh, uh, in order to achieve uh, the typical well thermal cycle we also need to understand the characteristic of a material as a function of a current and load, okay. So, in characteristic by meaning the ability to melt, right. So, for example, for a given thickness what factor determines the delta T, the change in temperature, right. So, for example, if you want to increase the temperature of material from 600 to say 1500, okay. And what do you need, what do you need to know? So, that now you can give a certain amount of energy, so that you can reach the delta T. Come on guys, you understand my question? No, right. So, if for your material, so material of A, right. So, this material now we are in room temperature, say 300 Kelvin and you will have to rise the temperature to say 1580 or we can say that 1900 Kelvin. How do you calculate how much energy you need to, to achieve this increasing temperature, delta T? Hmm? Yeah, exactly. You need to know specific heat capacity, right? So, delta T would be, how do you calculate delta T? So, Q is M C P delta T, right? Is not it? So, this is the definition of specific heat capacity. Is not it? Right? The C P is what is unit of C P? Joule kg per Kelvin. Exactly. So, what you need is we need to know how much of the J goes in, right? To know the required delta T. So, this will be delta T will be Q divided by M C P, right? So, now if you want to know how much Q you need to rise a delta T, so you need two factors. So, one factor is C P, so that is a material parameter, okay. And then the other only factor which determines the heat generation 
or heat required to increase the temperature from say a room temperature to melting point is the mass, is not it? So, mass here we, we define the mass in terms of thickness, okay. Say for example, if you have 1.2 mm thick, so we know the active volume, the active volume is defined by the cylinder, cylinder the diameter will be the electrode diameter, is not it? The height of the cylinder would be the combined thicknesses of the sheet, is not it? So, suppose if you have 1.2 mm, so you have an electrode something like this and then you place two sheets and then bottom electrode. <coughs> so, you apply load, is not it? So, we all already know the Q is I square or T, exactly. So, now we need to know delta T, is not it? So, how do you calculate delta T? Q you can know, if once you know R4 or R3 the contact resistance, so we can measure the Q. We know say for example, given time and a given current, right. Suppose if you want to know how much energy is needed to rise the temperature and so on so, only factor we know is the M. So, if M you can assume or you can calculate, assuming it there is a cylinder which is actually heating up. What is the height of the cylinder? The combined thickness of the sheets. So, once you know the cylinder volume, you know density of the material, you can calculate M. What is the volume of cylinder? Pi r squared h, is not it? So, you know r which is electro diameter, electro radius, h is the combined thickness, is not it? So, once you know the volume of uh, that cylinder, you know density of uh, steel or any uh, metal alloy you are using it. So, then you can calculate the M. So, once you know M, Cp is given, okay, and delta T is uh, say for example, you need to rise the temperature from room temperature to melting point then you can calculate the Q needed. So, once you know uh, the Q, amount of Q is needed, then we can back calculate what will be the current you want to use, right. So, we know the contact resistance, the once you know the contact resistance, then as a function of time you can measure or you can get the current, it is clear. So, this is how we develop the welding parameters to get uh, uh, a diameter equal to the, the well negative diameter, right. So, as a thumb rule the typical well nugget diameter is always 4 times square root of thickness, okay. So, if uh, your thickness is 1 mm, the well nugget diameter is acceptable well nugget diameter is 4 mm, okay. So, 4 mm means if you take a cross section basically. So, it will be like this, is not it? So, ideally you will get an average diameter. So, if this is 1 mm, so you need to achieve 4 mm well nugget diameter at the center axis of the weld. So, this is the weld cross section, okay. So, now we can calculate once you know the thickness, the required diameter how much current is needed for a given time of welding, is not it? So, we can use our physics to calculate the welding current and time is needed to achieve a required weld angle diameter, is clear? Yes or no? Okay, good. So, then once you do the all the calculations, so we can also establish what is known as well growth curves, okay. So, well growth curve is plotted as a function of current or welding time and then well nugget diameter I or T as a function of nugget diameter. Right? And this is for a given thickness because if you change the thickness M changes, is not it? Right? And then this curve will change. So, obviously. So, for a given thickness and given material, because you change the material, C p changes, right. So, by fixing the thickness and then C p, we can develop well nugget diameter and then uh, as a function of current 
and then or by fixing the time we can get the current is not it or by fixing the current you can get the time because those two are independent variables clear. So, we can develop the well nugget diameter the curve generally looks like this ok. So, there is a one current at which so we cannot form any well nugget because you form so much of liquid then if you are applying a load a liquid get expelled. So, that is the current at which the expulsion happens or splashing happens that current is known as the I max the current sorry this is I max. And this is the maximum well nugget diameter that you can form ok. Ok, so we will see in detail all these concept what I explained today's class right clear good. So, we will move on to the slides any questions so far from last class no good go ahead. So, it is a typical a simple well thermal cycle in order to achieve it and this is how we do ok. So, simple well thermal cycle I showed you in the previous graph simple current and then a load applied over a time is not it. So, what do we do in a simple uh, thermal cycle? So, there is a, a, a skews time, the load is increased ok. So, the moment you achieve a required uh, welding load then you start passing the current right. So, during this process you can keep the load constant and then uh, upon applying in the welding current over a welding time and then you switch off the current and release the load that is it. So, this simple well thermal cycle can give us the required current needed for generating a well nugget diameter right it is clear. So, the important con the, the components of this uh, entire well thermal cycle is the skews time, well time, hold time and off time. So, the entire well thermal cycle well welding cycle would run not more than uh, 200 milliseconds in a typical uh, uh, western spot welding right it is clear. But this is extremely simple in real life such a simple well thermal cycle we hardly use ok. So, we will have to introduce a lot of uh, modifications for example, you know that you know some alloys uh, you know uh, in, a, in a say for example, highly alloyed steel you will end up getting only martensite upon cooling because the cooling rate here as I said can go thousands of kelvins per second ok. So, it is very difficult to achieve uh, 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 other than uh, martensite uh, microstructure ok during welding. So, we may have to do an a uh, tempering treatment right. So, what do we do? So, we do a uh, second pulsing or a uh, post pulsing upon welding time. So, that you cool to room temperature and then subsequently you add an additional uh, pulse. So, that the martensite is in the well zone is getting tempered ok. So, we can also program that in the well cycle, cycle itself or you can also reduce the cooling rate by using a preheating. So, instead of uh, taking a temperature directly to room temperature you may also have a, a pre pulse a pulsing before the actual well, welding pulse. So, that means that you are preheating a temp, uh, the, the, your, uh, the, uh, the interface to a temperature of say 400 degree centigrade. So, that may reduce the temperature gradient and subsequently it can also reduce the cooling rate ok. So, in real life if you have if you have an advanced resistance spot welding equipment with a good PID control. So, what is PID? Yeah. So, the mechatronics guy should know about it. So, if he does not know then you have a problem. So, these are all the, the professional integration and differential control. So, these are the input output feedback control mechanism. So, any resistance part welding equipment would have a PID control to program a very complex well thermal cycle ok. So, it is an enhanced well thermal cycle what we use for example. So, you may have a loading cycle something like that. So, where you have an, a, a, a skews time where material is just a squash and then you may have a preheating. So, preheating 
is, is achieved by applying in a small short pulse. So, you, you may not use an, uh, a current pulse uh, of a novel thermal cycle where it will be few uh, kilo amperes. So, you may use an, uh, say one, one, I say uh, uh, 800 amperes or so. So, that the temperature is reached about 400 to 500 degrees centigrade at the interface. And subsequently, we can also ramp up the current slowly, okay, instead of having an, an, uh, doing an uh, immediate ramp up to an, a maximum 4, 5 kilo amperes. So, you can also slowly increase the current such a way that material also heats up reasonably slow heating rate in order to avoid this stress development in the material. And then uh, uh, during this process, you can also uh, apply an, uh, an a well time, maintain it and subsequently you can also slowly decrease the current in such a way that you maintain a cooling rate, right. And you may also increase the load upon cooling, it is also beneficial because in order to mitigate the residual stress that is forming uh, during welding, say uh, when the metal site forms, so you have a, 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 a tensile expansion and you can also accommodate that by applying a compressive force. Okay. So, in order to reduce the residual stress development in the weld, so you may also play around with the, the subsequently when the weld nugget is cooling down to room temperature, you may also increase the load in such a way that you apply in a compressive force to mitigate the tensile stress that is developing in the microstructure, right, it is clear. So, in a enhanced thermal cycle, typical thermic cycle, you have a skews time and then a preheating time and the upslope time and then actual welding time and in this welding time also, we can also have an, an in between a cooling time, okay. So, that is also possible, okay. So, you may also introduce an, an intermediate cooling so that no, you do not really uh, yeah, increase the uh, cooling rate and significantly, and then uh, subsequently, you can also change the uh, cooling rate upon uh, welding, okay. And then you have skews time to keep the stress. Uh, the compressive forces applied when the material is cooling down to room temperature and then subsequently you can also apply in a, a second start pulse post weld in order to heat up the, the weld nugget to a temperature where you expect an amortant side to get tempered, right, it is clear. So, these kind of complex weld thermal cycles are commonly used for engineering applications. So, that you no, know, uh, we can mitigate the microstructure development and the stress that is developed when you are uh, welding uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in an overlap configuration, right. And uh, the modern resistance particle equipment, they all of them are capable of generating such weld thermal cycles. And it is extremely important because you know if you look at welding metallurgy of uh, the automotive steels, okay, so it is difficult to uh, achieve uh, good mechanical properties without any post weld heat treatment, okay. Um, so, it is extremely important to use an a post pulsing in not only to temper the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the metastatic microstructure, also to uh, um, uh, homogenize the elemental segregation that is happening uh, in the microstructure. Otherwise, uh, the, uh, so if you look at the typical uh, the, the uh, 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 cross sectional OV of a resistance spot well, so this is the two sheet, okay. So, this is how you look like in resistance part well, near weld nugget here, is not it, in the cross section. So, this is a weld. And if you look at uh, a, a typical uh, resistance part well, you always have a notch at the weld center line. So, when you are uh, trying to pull in the tensile loading, so it is like in a notch and then uh, if you have very strong segregation of allowing elements at the weld center and this notch would act as a stress concentration area and then you will end up forming an, a crack going towards the well center line because well center line is the, the highly uh, segregated area that is the area where it solidifies at the end, okay. So, you expect an allowing element segregation make this well center line very brittle, okay. So, in order to avoid uh, the well center line uh, segregation, so you may also the, this post pulsing can be very helpful because this is like a heat treatment, homogenization treatment. So, after forming a well nugget, you form an, a, a subsequent pulse in such a way that you can homogenize the whatever element segregation happens in the well center line. We will see in detail when you move along. So, the post pulsing can be used to modify the microstructure to redistribute the stress so that the mechanical properties of the, the well nugget improves significantly, 
right it is clear the enhanced well thermal cycle is not it good. So, why is it pulsing here because of the alternating current ok. So, we always use an alternating current that is preferred for resistance welding ok good. So, in order to uh, com summarize the, the, the enhanced well thermal cycle, so we can apply a pre compressive force to set the electrodes over peaks together no, to that is a skews time right. Then, then we can apply preheating to reduce the thermal gradient at the start of the weld timing or to for example, to soften any surface coating is there right. So, once you apply a preheating, so you can also minimize the, the temperature gradient and then you can apply a forging force to consolidate the nugget and then you apply a weld thermal cycle or the, the actual welding time and then subsequently you can do a post pulsing for constant tempering right it is clear and you may also play around with the, the current decay especially in aluminum alloys to prevent hot cracking. Aluminum alloys are I mean extremely notorious to weld by resistance spot welding ok, resistance spot welding uh, of aluminum alloys and also the stainless steels. It's, stainless steels are nightmare to weld uh, in resistance spot weld. So, I never seen someone welded resistance spot welding of stainless steel without cracking ok. So, uh, stainless steels are reasonably good material if you are uh, uh, using a, a, a GMAW or GTAW to weld because you can play around with the solidification uh, uh, pattern, solidification uh, uh, method you can play around the dilution. So, that you know you, you can avoid hot cracking, but here there is no there is no way you can add a filler ok. So, it is all autogenous weld. So, if you are doing autogenous weld uh, and the stainless steel and aluminum alloy is uh, you know uh, they are prone for cracking because you also apply a load ok. So, compressive load becomes tensile in one axis. So, in that case you know in aluminum alloys and stainless steels they are really prone for cracking and they also have a, a thick oxide coating is not it oxide layer aluminum as well as stainless steel. So, the contact resistance can be huge ok. So, because of this presence of oxide layer. So, you may end up heating a lot right. So, you need to play around with the current decay or the uh, uh, down slope of the current in order to you know retard the, the, the uh, quenching of aluminum alloys uh, which can otherwise uh, lead to cracking ok it is clear. So, we can play around with these parameters to achieve uh, required uh, uh, the, uh, the well metal properties. Good. Any questions on this? It is extremely important to understand this because when you are doing an resistance spot welding in industry scale, you will all. So, the, these terms are very, very quite common skews time, for example, post pulse time, number of pulses. Ok. So, we always tell uh, the welding time in terms of cycles. Ok. So, suppose if you tell that uh, 10 cycles welding time and you are raising you are raising a 50 hertz AC. So, what will be the welding time? Hmm? So, 10 cycles means so 50 hertz means what is what do you mean by that 50 hertz in AC 50 cycles in 1 second is not it in 1 second. So, the 10 cycles would take come on guys 1 by 5 is not it. <laughs> so, 1 by 5 times that is a time required time that is a welding time ok. So, in, in, in if you look at in any uh, the you go to automotive industry what is the welding time they will take 10 cycles ok. So, because the 50 hertz is the most commonly used uh, uh, the current. So, the, the, the welding time is always measured in cycles ok. So, we will say 10 cycles of wells, 10 cycles in 50 hertz right, it is clear good. So, this is the typical uh, uh, again the schematic of the equipment. So, before going to this we also have such equipment in our lab. Okay, so, this is the industrial scale resistance spot well. So, what is you over here? Can you see clearly the picture? Okay. 
So, this is the cantilever which also has any the water inlet ok, so water inlet, water outlet, so water inlet, water outlet. So, that is to cool the electrode and you see here these two, these are the electrodes. So, now the sheet is not there, so it is placed between the electrodes right and the load is applied through this cantilever. So, we have some hydraulic, so this hydraulic mechanism is not it. So, this hydraulic apply a load required to keep the interface in contact and subsequently the, elect the electric current is passed and then water cooled the electrodes would pass the current between the phasing interfaces and then you form well nugget. Yes, it is clear? Okay, good. So, if you look at the schematic of this such setup and this is industrial scale resistance spot well. So, in a, in a, in a for example, in, in automotive platforms and these arms would be replaced by robots. Okay. So, these arms will be replaced by the robots. Okay. So, in this case in, a, in, a, in our lab, so we have an, a simple like cantilever beam so used to make the well nugget. So, this is a typical uh, single phase AC spot welding circuit. So, we have a transformer so in this transformer is somewhere over here. Okay. So, and then uh, you have a horn with the flexible conductor which is used to apply a uh, load and the, this is a typical uh, depth and this is the cantilever beam I was talking about and the water cooling goes in and comes out and then the, uh, the interface welding interface is kept between the electrodes and then uh, while applying a load we can pass the current you form the well nugget. Yeah, it is a simple schematic, it is clear. So, we can uh, play around with the, so nowadays this transformer circuit is also microprocessor controlled. Okay. So, we can also play around with the ramping time, cool down time, post pulsing, number of pulses, okay, so load and, and uh, let us see, uh, uh, squeezing load and then cooling load. So, everything can be play around, uh, varied based on the program what we use. Is clear? Good. Okay. So, this is the mass effect I was talking about. Okay. So, it is very important. So, in order to calculate uh, the amount of heat or energy needed to heat up a material for so typically you want to heat up from room temperature to uh, close to mel uh, the above melting point. Right. So, and now do you calculate how much current you need to achieve a required well nugget diameter? You can use a simple physics, physical law. Yeah. It is the mass of the nugget. So, how do you calculate? So, mass of the nugget can be calculated from the volume and the density. Okay. So, mass we assume for example, you know uh, the well nugget diameter, right? Suppose if you want to achieve well nugget diameter. Something like that. So, I am drawing I am drawing a cross section, okay. So, this is a cylinder what you form basically, is not it? So, once you are to know the uh, uh, well nugget diameter, required well nugget diameter, and then uh, the height of the cylinder will be the thickness, combined thickness, is not it? Is under the root, four root, three, four under root. Yeah, that is also you can assume. So, for example, uh, you can also say this is the top view. And this is your well nugget diameter. And if you look at the side view, you, you do not see unless you do a cross section, is not it? Yeah, because uh, the electrode is placed somewhere here like this uh, from the top, right. So, the well nugget diameter for if you want to get a required well nugget diameter, how much current you want to send for a given time? How do you calculate? So, you know the height of the cylinder, which is the combined thickness of the plate. So, you want to know the diameter. Okay. So, then you solve for the cylinder volume okay. and then you get uh, 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 m from that. I can, once you know the m, so you can calculate q. So, once you know the q for a given welding time, how much current you need that you can calculate, is not it? So, that is a simple. right? So, only trick here is the r. The r here is made of four components. Isn't it? R1, what is R1? 
electrode resistance or to seat resistance or the, the base material resi bulk resistance. R3 is the contact resistance, okay. the R4 is the resistance between the interface and the electrode. Okay. So, once you know the resistance, the basically we always assume the contact resistance is the, the maximum. So, uh, compared to contact resistance, other resistance are negligible. So, once you measure the contact resistance, so we can calculate the current required to form a given well diameter. Okay. Yeah. Here R2 means the contact Yes. Not any other R is a contact resistance, we can assume. Only only contact resistance, yeah. So, because say the contact resistance will be, will be uh, 100 times more than the, the bulk resistance of uh, the plate as well as the, the copper electrode, okay. And uh, the, inter the resistance between the electrode and the, the, the uh, workpiece, it is also negligible because the heat is extracted by the water, by the cooling that is not contributing the nugget growth. Okay, so, only resistance that is actually controlling here is the contact resistance between the sheet. Okay, so, once you know that and that can be calculated again uh, by using a uh, uh, simple bridge circuit, right. So, so, once you know the contact resistance for a given load okay, so, and then we can measure the current required for a given welding time to generate a well negative diameter of so and so, right, is clear. So, in, a, in, a, in an experimental point of view, we, we do not really like you know to make it life easy. So, we will measure experimentally what you know as weld growth curves. Okay. So, I so will come back to that. Okay. So, this is the weld growth curve because you asked the question. So, basically, the weld growth curve is we develop as a function of current and welding time what is the well nugget diameter. Okay, in this case, I plotted strength, strength is proportional to the well nugget diameter. Okay. So, if you look at the well growth curve, so you plot a, as a function of current or a welding time. So, either we fix a current, vary the welding time or you fix the time, vary the welding current. So, both will lead to increasing well nugget diameter. is not it? Because i square rt either fix t vary i or fix i vary t and both will lead to change in diameter. Okay, So, this is typically will be like this. Okay, So, there is a maximum current. Okay, So, that is i max. So, ideally the thumb rule is to achieve an optimum strength we always use the thumb rule of 4 times square root of thickness. So, if the thickness is 1 mm, well nugget diameter should be 4 mm. So, that is the typical. So, why 4 mm? So, because we can cover the entire cross section. Okay. So, that is why it is 4 mm. So, if you have an, an, an uh, ideal, uh, yeah, you can identify now. So, what current and time is needed to achieve a well nugget diameter of our interest. So, we cannot keep on increasing the current because upon I max, you have a, a more liquid formed and you are applying an skews force, the liquid would start splashing out, is not it? So, you form a liquid and you are applying compressive force. So, then uh, if you have an, uh, the, the, uh, the electrode applying a pressure and you have a sheet, okay. and if you start melting and if you make a large amount of liquid, then you apply pressure, then liquid cannot withstand the, the, the load, is not it? So, then it will start splashing out and this is known as expulsion or splashing. Okay. So, so, so upon increasing current to a certain level, you observe splashing and then you will not form male nugget, you will just have a cavity. Okay. So, the I max is the maximum current above which the splashing occurs. Right? So, generally we do not operate until I max. So, we will uh, operate much below I max, but we will have to know what, when I max is happening. So, these well growth curves can be plotted as a function of time by, by constant time and the varying current identify when is I max 
and then we can choose the Wilnecker di diameter which is required by the standard. Okay, it's clear. And you can also calculate from the, the physics. So what I and T you need to get for a given m, Cp is fixed and m is from the thickness. Right? It's clear. Is that no? This is simple, right? Simple balance. Good. <coughs>